Hello, I'm Gary Quinn, and welcome to another episode of Ready, Set, Live. My guest today is Lee Purcell, a multi-Emmy nominated actress, producer, and director. She starred in the feature film Carol of the Bells, directed by Joey Travolta. Her Emmy nominations include The Long Road Home, starring opposite Mark Harmon, and Secret Sins of the Fathers, starring opposite Bo Bridges. Lee has also starred in many successful projects such as Love at First Glance, Due South, Valley Girl, and the cult favorite Big Wednesday. Don't go away. I'll be right back with the beautiful Lee Purcell. Hello, Lee. Welcome to the show. Hello, Gary. Thank it's, you so much for having me. It's so great to have you in studio. It's so great to actually be with you in person. I know. You know, we have a long history of meeting and knowing it, each other, but we really didn't connect until, I guess, about six months ago, really. Maybe. maybe. But anyway, your story, your life is amazing and iconic. And how did your extraordinary path, I know you started when you were a little girl, how, what, was it an intention that you set or you just said, I want to do this? Uh, do you mean acting? Yes. Well. And dancing. And dancing and directing and writing and other things. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's one of those things that I kind of just fell out of the womb doing it. And that's what. Um, a friend of mine always said to me because I started everything really young my we, we moved a lot as we discussed earlier as did you oh I love that picture it's from Dirty Little Billy oh yes that was a movie by the way uh, that was how old were you there you were a baby mm, 19 maybe and, and I was that, playing 13 and that was opposite um, who was in that movie that was uh, that was Michael Pollard and Richard Evans yes and um, I mean, you basically, after you started really moving into your bliss, you know, as Joseph Bliss, uh, Joseph Campbell would say, yes, I love you Joseph started Campbell. to live your bliss by an intention that started happening. And it's almost like you were following the path, even though you didn't know um, that you were going to get all these roles and how I you just stepped know. into it. You did know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I knew uh, because I think I think one does and if you have that um, goal but I started at three I was uh, we were living in Dallas one of the many places we lived and I was um, tapped by Neiman Marcus to be a toddler model model in their flagship store and, uh, and that was my first paying gig. I was three. I think my parents were like, just get out of the house and earn some money. You know, you've laid around here long enough. <laughs> and, um, and then started doing a, a TV show when I was five and when we were living in um, the Millington Na Naval Base and did that. And things just evolved. And then I knew that I wouldn't get any... Uh, support or encouragement for the career that I I had chosen, so I didn't tell anybody. And I just started saving my money at 13, and you opened that bank account. I opened a bank <laughs> account. I opened yes, I did at 13, 12, 13. You could do that in those days. Now, of course, you know you you'd have to have 10 bodyguards and <laughs> uh, you know and whatever. Bill Gates come along with you. So, but then you could do it. I just walked downtown and opened up this bank account, and it was my journey money. And then I had enough money by the time I was, well, really 16, but I wasn't allowed to leave until I was 17. Mm -hmm. And I remember, fast forward, when you came to Hollywood, mm -hmm. your car crashed. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, hadn't even, yeah, I hadn't even arrived at my destination. I was... Uh, funny, I was out. I was in Eagle Rock on the freeway, and I got in a horrific, horrific car car crash, and barely survived it, but did survive. It's a long story. I'm not going to go into it. Um, and uh, then I had no car, and and then thanks to the taxi kindness, driver, kindness of a good Samaritan, a taxi driver, African American taxi driver who followed me and the police to the hospital and he picked up 
my shredded belongings for about a mile along mm. the freeway because my car had flipped and turned and and flew through the air and everything had come out and um, he was amazing and he took me to uh, after I had been treated he took me to my grandmother's apartment which was very far away I, I have no sense of direction I've never had one kind of a problem when I was a dancer you know go left and go right <laughs> and um, and he took me to Inglewood, which is where I was trying to get to, but I thought Inglewood was Eagle Rock. <laughs> and there was no GPS in those days. So anyway, he took me there and he sat with me and, and comforted me and made me tea and, and then never told me his name because I, I wanted to know his name so I could validate him to his company and wouldn't take any money. Wow. So that was That was your guardian angel. He wa oh he you was. Know? He saw the accident. He saw it and he um, and I was just a kid, you know, and I didn't know anything. And but I did have the key to my grandmother's apartment. She wasn't there. She was uh, in another state, but I had a place to sleep. I didn't have a car. Wow. So, you know, everybody goes through hard knocks. It's and you I, I know you took the bus and you started working in a club and, yes. and then you said, I don't want to do this. And then someone said, you should be a model. Yes. And then you started modeling. And I love when you went into Cunningham Agency. Yes. And you didn't have an appointment. No. And you just said, you're going to represent me. Yes. And he sat down with you and said, yes. He Yes. And, and there's a little bit of a backstory behind that uh, that I'll make quick. But his um, daughter had died of a drug overdose dose not long before that. And he saw me, you know, like nobody from nowhere, and he thought, I got to save her. And he was, a, he was the biggest commercial uh, agency in Hollywood. And I had gone down the list that I had gotten from Screen Actors Guild. And, and I started with the A's, and obviously it took me to the C's, <laughs> and near the bottom of the C's. And, to, uh, and I would just walk in in my tacky clothing and and um, my uh, heavy accent and I would just walk in and I happened to walk in and he happened to be there and the receptionist you know said do you have an appointment I said no but he has to see me he needs to see me and and he came out which I think was very unusual and because of what had happened with his daughter he he felt a fatherly kindness toward me and he signed me and I did very well. I did very well for him. Now, was that when you said, no, that was a different, and I'll, I'll get to that. You know, and, and the thing is, what, what I love about these stories and your, your life path of your soul journey mm -hmm. is that you had an intention of believing. There must have been that in your subconscious because when people are in a positive state of mind and they set that intention, the doors open. And look at the, you know, the taxi driver, uh, the gentleman, the Cunningham. And mm -hmm. then the next thing was he kept wanting to do audition and Steve McQueen mm -hmm. yes. shepherded you. Yes. And he, he basically me. brought you under his wing and said, this is the girl I want to play the part. I mean, how amazing and, and, and brilliant is that? It was astonishing. <laughs> it, it was because I really had so... I had a lot of training. I had trained really hard, and I was still training. And I was doing, you know, acting classes and dance classes and improv classes and singing classes and all kinds of classes. And and um, so I was I was prepared training wise. I'd even taken classes about how to be on the set, you know, how to hit your marks. And I, I wasn't um, ignorant, but I was naive. So. Did you did you do a uh, was oh look there you are with Steve oh, I, know, I love that picture that picture was in the office correct yeah that's in his office that's his office that yeah. is here in Sherman Oaks yes. still but Studio City Studio yeah. City and I mean hmm. you had a kinship it's almost like a soul connection and I really feel yeah. that people have that and people open the doors to you because they feel that and you hmm. obviously had similar backgrounds or experiences and he felt it well we you know I had to audition five times for that movie and because I was an unknown completely unknown no one and and then on the I think it was after the third audition then uh, briefly 
I got a call on a Saturday morning, you know, could you come in, come to the office like right now? And I was, I'd been out gardening and I was dirty and sweaty. My hair was stringy. And I said, just, can I come over in an hour? Just give me, no, you have to come now. And uh, I was like, okay. And I thought, well, I'll just go like this because I'll, I'm just going to go over and pick up some more sides, you know, some more pages for uh, from the next audition. And that's what I thought. It was a Saturday morning. And I went over and I, I knew the office very well by this time. And I walked up the stairs and walked into the, to the main room and there was Steve McQueen. And I wasn't intimidated by him because... You know, you have to remember, he was of my parents' generation. Mm -hmm. So he was, um, to me, an older man. Like a big brother. Like a big brother, like a father, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't, I hadn't seen that many of his movies. I, I Of course, I, was, I had seen Bullet. And that was extraordinary, still is. And um, and I just walked in and, and I was like, uh, uh, oh, hi. And because... <laughs> The only thing that I just wanted the job, huh. and and I knew he'd be my boss. And so then he said, "Oh hi, I'm Steve," and I'm, I was like, yeah, "I know," and uh, I'm Lee. And and then we talked for like two three hours. And he just went sat on sofas in his office, and we just talked. And then he cast you in Adam at six a.m. Two more auditions after, oh, after that, that. Still, still, and then that was with Michael Douglas. Well, Michael hadn't been hired oh. yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I was the first person to be hired, and I don't know why that's so rare, or it certainly was then. It's more common now for the woman to be hired first, but it was very rare then. And he hired me, and, and then I had to screen test with all the guys who were under consideration. And then one day they, they said to me, um, oh, we, we think we have, you know, Adam, the guy. I said, who is it? And they said... Kirk Douglas's son, because Michael, it was his third movie, but he wasn't known. And I was like, oh, great, you know. And then we worked together and rehearsed, and um, he was great. Everybody was great. It was a wonderful experience. The movie was not a hit, but it was a wonderful experience. Was there a ritual that you did during that time that it was like a, almost like uh, something you did for good luck or did you meditate or were you just mm. stretching as a dancer in the morning or lose, you know, you did a lot of exercises of, of vocal and this and that, but right. what about, was there a, not a superstition or you had a, a, a spiritual thing you would do, a little prayer, a little something that you would do? No, I, you know, I'm trying to remember I, I would ride my motorcycle, and I know that's not exactly... You had a motorcycle. I, oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and uh, and that was another thing Steve and I had in common. You know, we both rode motorcycles, and we both liked fast cars. And I, I would ride my motorcycle, and I found that to be very um, freeing. Mm -hmm. it, it really cleared your head out. And I would do that. and And then... Really, not much else. Yeah, just that because I was really so uh, ambitious, and I was so hardworking, mm -hmm. and going to so many different classes, and working on scenes and scripts, and just trying to really be trained. And and uh, and I was, and. So it was really just me and my motorcycle. So after that job. Is that when you moved to London, or was London yes. before? Yes. No. Okay. No. I I think I did a movie with Orson Welles before I moved to London. I can't quite remember because, remember, I, I kept working here, mm -hmm. even though I lived in London. So I was a, I was a commuter. And um, and it sounds very glamorous, but it, it wasn't. Stressful. <laughs> it was stressful, but also because uh, at, at that time, there was a very popular thing in London that you could join, uh, join um, one of these clubs, clubs <laughs> that um, got you cheap airfare. And so I joined the uh, the men's football team club. <laughs> And and I would get these ridiculously cheap airfares. So I was able to just go and back and forth, back and forth all the time. 
and I had I, I didn't have a place here anymore. I had gotten rid of it, and I had a place there, and that, so my home was in London. But I also worked here. I worked here a lot, and then I was training. Mm-hmm. And then I, I was training in London and uh, with uh, my teacher there, my drama teacher, and also my French teacher. And, and, but then I would fly back over here. And there was actually a, a, like a bunch of us who did that at that time in those days. And it was interesting because I would see somebody at a party in L.A. and then go back home to London and see them at a party in London or in an audition or... A studio, or it was this group of kind of gypsy people, <laughs> and it was it was really fun. Circus people, <laughs> just, we're like circus people. Um, yeah. Where did you live in London? I lived in Sloan Square. Okay, okay. What was the 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 memorable or mo- uh, or favorite thing takeaway that you took away from London? The energy, the feeling, just. Well, remember that wasn't my only. Uh, I mean, I kept even after I moved back. I I kept going back and because I still had these really cheap tickets, right? <laughs> and I would go back for the weekend and go shopping or see my friends and because these tickets were so cheap. And um and then and then uh, many years went by and then I started teaching in London. Mm. And so I taught there at, I well in England. Uh I in Sussex and uh so I I taught there for mm, at the festival for maybe 10 years. I only stopped that about, well, pre-pandemic, about two years ago. So what did I take away? I, I took away a lot because I had, when I first went to London, it was after I had done a movie. I think it was Dirty Little Billy, not quite sure. But I finally had enough money to uh, take my grandmother to Europe. And which I, I had, when I was a little girl, that's interesting, when I was a little girl, like two and a half, and my grandmother said to me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be a movie star. I'm going to buy you a big car. And I was two and a half. And so then later, when I grew up and was starring in movies and I had money, I said to her, you want the big car? She said, no. Uh, I said, you want to go to Europe? She said, yes. And so I took my grandmother to Europe for a month. And and when I now I had not been to Europe at that point. I was still very young. And we got off the plane and it hit me like very emotional, very like a ton of bricks. It just hit me. And I turned to her and I said, I'm home. Hmm. And then I got down on the tarmac and kissed the ground. It was very wow. emotional. You really loved your grandma. She was my best friend. Wow. Yeah. Um what is the most important lesson you've learned in life so far? Oh my gosh, that's gosh, Gary. <laughs> Switch oh, let me gears. Just, let me just pick that out of the air. <laughs> wow, thanks a lot. <laughs> wow, huh? The most important. Well, hmm, that's really a tough one. There's so many important lessons in life, and as you get older. You know, when you look back, you realize a lot of things that you thought were important are not important at all. And what comes to mind, what comes to mind for me is the most important lesson. And and there aren't, there isn't just one. (laughs) Don't you do that (laughs) to me. (laughs) But one of the most important lessons is uh, be ethical. Mm -hmm. Do the right thing. Be kind. This is all kind of, these are many words, but it's all the same harmonic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. Mm-hmm. Um, don't, don't do bad things to other people. A, it's very wrong. And B, it's going to come back and bite you. Correct. And so to me, that is a really important, not the most important maybe, but it's, it might be this, it might be, you know what? It might be the most important one. Mm-hmm. 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 But I think that that's what comes to mind first. There are other, there are many life lessons as you go through life and you get older, hopefully. <laughs> who, who influenced you the most in this life and that you admire? Was it Steve? Here you go again. <laughs> 
these big, huge <laughs> <Questions>. concepts <laughs> the, and questions. <laughs> the top top person or top, the top. Well, I I I can't say that. I mean, because you have different people in different stages of life who influence you mm -hmm. as you uh, you know from being a child. Who was the first one? Oh, my grandmother. Okay. Oh, I mean, Good. both my grandmothers right. actually, my maternal grandmother and my paternal grandmother, and. Um, but because I lived with my maternal grandmother, uh, I, she was more present. I mean, my paternal grandmother was not that far away once we stopped moving. Mm -hmm. But um, my maternal grandmother was uh, quite an incredible person. And she uh, lived through a lot of hard times, a lot of suffering. And But she uh, just kept going. And... I could write a whole book just about her because she was so inspirational without trying to be inspirational. It wasn't like she preached to me or it wasn't like she, I mean, she she was great in giving me some sage advice, but she wasn't that kind of a, of a person. She just lived by example. Mm. And, and she was really one of the most talented people I ever met, not in terms of performing, but in terms, you know, she was a nurse. She was a poet. She was incredible at making. She made all my clothes. She wallpapered the house. She refinished the floors. She painted everything. She, she saved our old clothes and then cut them into strips and dyed them and made what's called rag rugs out of them. And they're beautiful. I still have some of them. Mm. Knitted all my sweaters. Every winter, she'd say, uh, what kind of sweaters do you want this year? And I'd tell her, and we'd go down to the knitting store and I'd pick out you know the colors of of the of the knitting stuff whatever that is she <laughs> the yarn to, thank you she tried to teach me how to date I just had no patience uh, and a pattern and she would make it so so at you know until she died she was a, a great inspiration mm. uh, uh, to me and then um, I had a couple of teachers who were great inspirations in in school and then Steve Steve mm -hmm. McQueen. Mm -hmm. He was. He was. Uh, he taught me a lot. And uh, but you know what it was, Lee. You you had a and 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 Big Wednesday is where I first saw you. I didn't meet you. Right. But I was an extra. I, and, and you were a boy on and the surfboard. I was a surf, and, and 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 I saw you, and I saw Jan Michael Vincent and and Patty De Arvinville and. You had this glow about you. Oh, you were thanks. so beautiful. Oh. I remember. There you are. That picture. It was. Oh, yeah, it was. Great it was glowing. And I remember, just who is this woman? You stood out over the rest of them. There oh, was some gosh, kind of thank energy. You. Thank you. And at this time, I didn't know you. I didn't know Hollywood. I didn't know show business. I just thought, oh, okay, I'll just go audition, be an extra. Why not? And the key is, though, that I never forgot that essence that you have and i believe that thank you, you have that thank you and you still have it because you're still beautiful and glowing thank you um but i think the thing is that we all go through life and you have to look at your life as it's still a success you know uh, i believe everything we do continues to be a, a success whether you're on a hit show or you're doing a movie this week or you're making a pasta or writing a book. Yeah. You know, you're still the success, Lee Purcell, which you will continue to do. And I really feel that, you know, it's it's time for people to not be afraid thinking that their career is over. It's only the beginning. And, um, and I don't think that. But I know I know people who do. Who do, yeah. And but because I am uh, a union activist. Mm-hmm. And I am the co-chair of the National Seniors Committee, which we are renaming. And um, I'm familiar with this with this theme, but it is really um, impressive and inspirational to me that I do work with a lot in in my capacity, a lot of older people, and really, I mean, I'm talking people in their 90s, mm -hmm. and it's a I'm very fortunate uh, that I get to do this, even though it's really hard work and it's unpaid, but it's it's great because I get to see people who are older than me, people who are younger, people my age, and they are so involved and 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 so active. Whether they're 
currently acting, not currently acting. They've had a lot of very, very long careers, very successful careers, and and they want to help others, which is why we all do this service. And And I just look at them and I think, gosh, I wish everybody could see these people mm -hmm. the way I see them, because th for them, and I think this is so common with performers and artists, there is no end. Mm -hmm. There's no end. And okay, so you're not playing the roles you played when you were 25. Or, and I, 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 always, I always have always admired Catherine Deneuve and the French actress. And, and I, I read a lot about her and, and look up to her. And, and I don't know her. But she said recently, because she's still working, and she said recently, you know, as you get older and you're still working, you're still doing movies, maybe you're not the center of the movie uh, anymore, like you were when you were young, but you're there and you're and you're contributing and you are and you're part of it. And I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense to me, just a lot of sense. Mm. And and also people should know as a producer, you are doing a project, the Hollywood Radio Players, yes, uh, with Tom Bergeron as the host. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That must be a lot of fun. It is so much fun. It's a long story how we, which we don't have time for, but how we got there. But so what we are doing is we reenact, and we created uh, a a technique, a technology by combining technologies of Zoom. Uh, digital special effects, live special effects, sound effects, costumes, because it, they are classic radio plays from, from the 20s to the 50s, but we do them visually and, and, of course, audio. And so we call it Radio You Can See. And, and we, do, we put up a, one show a month, and you can see these shows at HollywoodRadioPlayers.com. And we raise money. Uh, for the Motion Picture and Television Fund, which is everybody's pet uh, charity in Hollywood because it helps so many people in the industry. And the pandemic really hurt uh, Motion Picture and Television Fund. So we are helping to raise money. But you can see the shows, whether you donate or not. We, of course, hope you will. But if you don't, you don't. And the shows are, <laughs> they're really incredible. And Tom is a great host. He is going to be taking a leave of absence for a while because he has some other things to do. That's okay. He'll come back. And he's also going to be in some of our shows because he was in one of our shows when we used to perform live before the pandemic. And so it's uh, you can see how happy I am about this. Yes. It's, it's a great thing to do. And and we are, um, my, my partner Michael Carnegie and I, we are really radio nerds and um or radio geeks and because we just love uh, we love doing this and we love all the well classic i am shows. so excited for this and if anybody wants to hear more about it they can go to hollywoodradioplayers.com mm -hmm. or to your website leepercell.com yes i want to thank you for this slice of history and time and I know we have to do it again because you've Let's got to write a book. <laughs> There's too many amazing stories, <laughs> thank Lee. Thank you. Thank you. And keep up the brilliance of your work. And thank I thank you, so you for who you are oh, and appreciate you. Gary, and I like to say the same to you. Thank you for who you are and for extending yourself outwards to others um, in such a, a good and decent way. And, uh, and also to everybody out there. This is a this is a great show. Keep watching it with Carrie Quinn, <laughs> and um, and I just hope everybody has a wonderful life. Thank you so much, Lee. I'm Gary Quinn. Join me for another episode of Ready Set Live. Until next time, be well. <laughs>